Greetings, everyone. I am very excited today to be interviewing Mia Ferraletto and talking about s- some of her journey and what she's been doing and her current process. Um, and again, as I was saying before we got on for the interview, Mia, I see you as one of these extraordinary Aquarian innovators holding those paradigms, and you have for decades held the paradigms of the Aquarian age in terms of your passion for justice, for being a bridge builder across cultures, for valuing truth and consciousness and compassion and healing. So we're going to talk some about your incredible journey, but let me just uh, give a brief bio before we get into our conversation. So Mia is a well-known art advisor, activist, and artist. She was the creator of A Shelter from the Storm, Artists for the Homeless in New York, and Art Walk New York, an annual event for the Coalition for the Homeless that has been copied around the country since 1995. She has served on numerous boards, is the publisher of New Observations Magazine, and I'll have the link for that below the video. She also has a new observations podcast, is the producer of consciousness and contact conferences that have gotten worldwide recognition. Um, And we're going to be talking today some about your project of the last four or five years of working with the Pine Ridge Dakota tribe to bring back 150 artifacts to the tribe of artifacts that were stolen after the Wounded Knee Massacre. So again, so much of your work has been about fostering justice, healing, um, really working to use art and creativity for supporting people in their healing journey. So let's talk some about this current project that you're in and then some of the other work that you've done. Well, thank you, Heather, Heather, for this incredible opportunity. It's an honor for me to be here with you and your audience. I, um, last year in January, began uh, working on the return of the artifacts that were taken at Wounded Knee from the dead. And it's a very interesting story. Um, the, the men that were hired to dig the mass grave at Wounded Knee um, took these uh, objects and artifacts off of the the dead bodies and buried them until things calmed down in the area. And then they were um, sold ultimately to a traveling salesman named Frank Root. Uh, And Frank would go to department stores in different parts of the country and exhibit the artifacts Mm -hmm. um, with incredible descriptions that were so offensive and racist, just unbelievable. And people would come into the stores and increase what they were buying just to see his collection. It turns out that he was from Barrie, Massachusetts, and he ultimately um, sold, but he did receive some money for it as well, uh, sold and donated part of the collection to the Woods Library, uh, the Woods Memorial Library in Barrie, Massachusetts. And these items were housed for over a hundred years in a long, narrow room, uh, similar in dimensions to the grave at Wounded Knee, which I was struck by immediately when I went to see them for the first time, with no climate control. Um, Some items were piled on top of others. There was no light. the the curtains were drawn. It was almost like entering into a wound. And um, I divide my time between Vermont and South Dakota. I'm very active on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And a woman from Vermont who had traveled out to Pine Ridge numerous times told me about the library. The library was only open three days a year for a few hours each day. So in no way was this a museum collection? Um, and she said, I have a feeling that you can do something about this. So please look into it. And when I returned to Vermont, 
um, in August of 2021, after my conference was over uh, on Pine Ridge, I started calling the, li the library, the museum. By then it was called the Barry Museum Association, which had rooms that were part of the library. And I was getting the runaround, you know, I, I was being told all kinds of things. And finally, I was told that I would hear from them in January of 2022 when, you know, I started doing this in September of 2021. So finally, I, I called in at the end of January into February. I was calling regularly and I said, I, I'm not, you know, I feel like I'm getting the runaround and I'm about to start my letter writing campaign. So... <laughs> Um, literally the next day I had an email back, uh, from a member of the board of the museum association, setting up a time, an appointment for me to go. And what had started to happen about a, a month before is the ancestors started to congregate here in Vermont where I live. And I kid you not, I would be typing on the computer enough is enough. And I would be hearing in my ear, enough is enough. You know, I mean, it was, it was, they were with me all the time. And um, <clears throat> I drove over there on February 24th, which was the first day of the war in the Ukraine. Uh, and it was actually the anniversary of a very serious car accident that I had had in, in 1998. So I knew it was a very critical day, you know, for me and my my father's mother was from the Ukraine. So there were a lot of, um, you know, omens around around me, surrounding me. And I got there and met with um, three members of their board and they were just horrified. They were just horrified by me um, because I, I said, this is not acceptable. You know, this is morally and ethically wrong. And these items have to go back to the Lakota people. Um, numerous times, members of the Oglala Sioux tribe had traveled to Barry asking for their return and just systematically rejected. In 1993, the New York Times did an article about it. And um, a member of, of the library staff at that point had no idea what they even had, uh, she, it was her belief that they were just decorative items, um, having nothing to do with their actual provenance. So um, we sat there and they told me stories like, um, well, this is going to take a very long time to negotiate and figure out, you know, our hearts are in the right place, but this is, this is really going to take a long time. So I, I looked them in the eye and I said, um, it's entirely up to you how you're viewed. You can either inspire others to do the right thing and return the artifacts and remains that they have in their possession, or you can become the next generation of perpetrators. Uh, mm -hmm. The decision is yours. And, um, and again, I heard all the reasons why, you know, this board member is sick and this is happening and this is happening. And my response was amazing grace happens in an instant. Mm. So I went home and wrote a proposal for them. And um, I was kicked up to the president of the board of the museum association, who's a lawyer. So from that point, I was dealing with um, an, an attorney represent, essentially representing them. And they had not kept up with their nonprofit status since 19, uh, since 2016, they had not filed. So a simple postcard filing they had not kept up with. And <clears throat> they were, um, you know, there were other issues, of the climate control on such valuable pieces was extraordinary, you know, having been in the art world my entire adult life, the fact that they were not cared for in, in the way that they should have been was really a concern of mine. And um, <clears throat> I let them know that my, my dear friend, Chief Henry Redcloud had agreed to come out to Barry to meet with them um, to discuss the return of the artifacts. And they were resistant to set up this meeting and it wasn't until the week before that I actually had an agreement 
with them to meet because I started generating all of these articles in the press. Um, and there were many people living in the area who had thought that the artifacts had actually been returned decades ago. Wow. So it was a big, big secret, you know, that they were there and um, that they were hanging on to them. And um, April 6 was the day we had our meeting. I rented the town hall, uh, which was packed. There was dozens Dozens of people were standing in the back, back. We had our meeting with the board at noon and I drove into the parking lot at about 1130 and the chairman of the board of the library came out um, to my car, even though we had never met, she knew who I was and, and came directly to the car and said, we had a meeting of the board last night and we've unanimously voted to return the artifacts. And that was because of the press and, and the gathering at town hall with the press conference following the meeting. And in our meeting with the board, you know, there was a lot of hedging, you know, about how long this was going to take. And the chairman of the library came up to me at the end of the meeting and she said, you know, together we will get this done. You know, don't worry, together we will get this done. So all this time, um, other board members absolutely hated me. Um, they did not want me part of the repatriation process. And, and you know, I was working directly with the Oglala Sioux tribe, you know, living so close by um, and, and getting letters both from Henry Red Cloud in support of me and President Kev Kevin Killer of the Oglala Sioux tribe wrote a letter as well. So um, they were stuck with me as, as contentious as it was at times. And on November 5th, um, the artifacts were returned home. We had an event in Barrie with over 400 people attending, um, medicine people, uh, Richard Broken Nose and Richard uh, Moose Camp came. And the energy that they brought into the room was, uh, unbelievable you know it was so the ancestors were all there and in in july two members of the oglala sioux tribe leola one feather and um jeffrey not helps him uh came out to help photograph the collection john willis who teaches at rhode island school of design uh photographed each of the pieces um to record them and as an inventory and what was remarkable about them when they were all out on tables in this big room, it was overwhelming because they looked like they had been created the day before. The colors were all incredibly vibrant and um, perfect. Um, the patterns, you know, we there. there's a ghost shirt, you know, that the, the blood from the massacre is still on, but in terms of the workmanship, there was no damage or corrosion. Um, and personally, I believe it's a spirit of the Lakota people that kept these <laughs> objects in this state. And they, they knew they were going home. You know, the, the, I had been warned by the people on Pine Ridge to be careful because the spirits were really angry that they were stuck in Barrie and not able to make the journey um, and when I walked into that room, I, I, I just felt such happiness and, and really joy because they knew they were going home. And when Leola and Jeff were there photographing with John, they saw a little girl, a little um, Lakota girl in, in the room and her teepee was moved, uh, actually physically moved while they were standing there watching yeah. it. Wow. Wow. So, um, so, you know, on so many levels, this was so healing and profound, Mia. I, I, you know, the the artifacts are at the Oglala Lakota College and, and the faculty and staff are talking about, have been talking about um, <clears throat> the poltergeist activity, the spirit activity at the college now since it started as soon as they came back. And um, as we've talked about before, um, 
the last pass of the U.S. Pluto return was on exact the anniversary of the Wounded Knee Massacre, um, December 29th. And the ceremony for the return of the artifacts happened that day out in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And people I've spoken to who carried the boxes of artifacts were laid on top of the grave. Um, the snow created like a very hard surface, like a table for the boxes to set be set on, upon. And the people who carried the boxes all said that the boxes were lighter than when they put them on the grave. They weighed less because the spirits had come to claim their possessions so that they could make the journey. And many people told me they saw ancestors. They actually had visitations. Um, once the artifacts were brought home. So just think about all these artifacts and human remains that are being held all around the world that don't belong to these people, you know? Um, they need to go home to their families and their tribes and, and you know, historically all of it needs to be returned. Um, there's no excuse. I mean, think of the Presbyterian church, how they would feel if their relatives bones, you know, were on view somewhere and they're, you know, crocheting or knitting or whatever had been stolen from the family. Um, and, you know, we have to, as a, as a country claim ownership for the horror that we have created the, and continue to create, you know, this is not an isolated incident, but, but this massacre was energetically what shifted the ley lines running through South Dakota to all the sacred sites from Wounded Knee by, by three degrees. And as your fr friend Rory Duff um, talks about, you know, his work is incredible in terms of working with groups of people to shift the ley lines back and the return of the artifacts um, to, to Pine Ridge is, is part of that. It's definitely a, a part of that. Um, and um, what was so- and, and as you were saying, Mia, too, I think it's such a critical part of this country. You know, the lunar nodes have been in South Node, they've shifted now, but they've been in South Node and Scorpio, North Node and Taurus. What has been hidden in the shadows that needs to be brought to the light of consciousness right. for the healing that needs to happen? The United States has been in this Pluto return and it also is moving into its Chiron return. So it is such a time, I think, for this country to face the wounding that is so intrinsic to the origins of this country, both in terms of what's been done to the indigenous people that were living here, but also what's been done to the Africans that were enslaved here. So I think it's part of what's critical in this country is to be facing the trauma from the past, to be really doing the healing work that's needed to be done to come back into alignment with what this country says its values are about. But this project that you did is such a profound part of that, bringing that to the light of consciousness and creating a context for healing. And talk a little bit about how you got involved with the Pine Ridge tribe and how that's been an integral part of your life now for so many years. Well, in in many ways, although I didn't know it at the time, I was very blessed because my mother's mother's second husband was Native American from one of the Eastern tribes. So I actually grew up with an Indigenous step-grandfather. Um, and the fact that, you know, he was Indian to me, I always looked up to him um, and and just it was always in me, you know, I was always pulled to him. But um, um, the movie Thunderheart, which came out in 1992, was incredibly influential uh, in my life personally, because I felt it, it, you know, it just reverberated inside me to such a profound extent 
that I knew that I would go out to Pine Ridge one day and I was involved in helping to legalize the industrial hemp movement in America. Um, I created an event in New York City called Hemp New York City and published an issue of new observations on industrial hemp back in uh, 2017 uh, at a very early age, you know, it, within the movement, it, it had really just been catching hold. So um, Alex Whiteplume, uh, my dear friend who is um, one of the lead heroes of the industrial hemp movement with permission from the Oglala Sioux tribe, he started planting hemp uh, in the 19, late 1990s. And every year the federal government would come in right before he was to harvest his crop and rip it up and confiscate it, rip up the entire crop. So he fought the federal government for 16 years to and won the right to grow hemp on the Pine Ridge Reservation, sovereign land. You know, technically speaking, the feds have no right to go in uh, and do what they did, but um, he, he's just an extraordinary man. And his deceased wife, Deborah White Plume, was uh, a major activist. They're both of them, but she um, was a lead water protector and um, uh, just very instrumental. Uh, she died two years ago this past November. Um, but when she passed, the New York Times and everyone just did massive. Uh, obituaries about Deb. So um, I got to know Alex through the hemp movement. And um, in July of 2018, I exhibited art all made from hemp or about mm -hmm. hemp at the Santa Fe Art Fair. Uh, and we, we were considered one of the highlights of the fair. Again, it was very much breaking ground. And the last day in the art fair, well, I was leaving for Pine Ridge as soon as the art fair was over. And the last day of the fair, I was alone in the ladies room and a chief came to me uh, in, in white buckskin, full color embroidery, long white hair. And he said, um, the path is clear. You're protected along the way and they're waiting for you there. And um, I was really <laughs> profoundly influenced by that experience because he was right. I mean, I was accepted um, by, you know, the key leaders uh, uh, virtually automatically. I mean, it's, it's, you know, Native Americans have been lied to so many times, uh, it's hard to, to trust. And I, I truly believe it's because of my spiritual nature that it functions very much along the same lines, you know, as they have chosen to live their lives and their culture and, and their spiritual beliefs that I, you know, I just was welcomed in, um, and it's very rare, you know, it, it happens, but it usually takes time and they put up with me. I mean, I can be very stubborn and uh, <laughs> opinionated, but, um, but my policy in life is to just always tell the truth. You know, I mean, spirituality, the one basic tenant, in my opinion, is simply being honest to yourself and others, even if it's a little unpleasant or, you know, little white lies don't cut it um, because we're we're distorting our um, our center, our core. Whereas if we're honest with ourselves and others as a as a you know standard practice, there's no need for all this ambivalence around us, and it greatly impacts our ability to manifest um, and and to live in a world in a cohesive world where we are then connected, you know, to all realms, to, to everyone and, and everything. And, um, that's beautifully I, said, Mia, beautifully said. And I, I firmly believe, and this is part of why I think your work as a bridge builder across the cultures is so critical. I truly believe that we're, as we're in this incredible time of transition and transformation on the planet, we need to honor and reconnect 
with the wisdom that the indigenous people have held across thousands and thousands of years that is about being in right alignment and being in truth and justice and right relationship with all of the life around them. That that is what we need in modern cultures need to remember and come back into connection with. So I think that's that's your way of being and that was recognized by the people in the tribe there, but it's also what we're needing to, to come back into connection with, to heal on the planet in this time collectively. I agree with you completely, Heather. Um, also, when you look at, at indigenous people and say their relationship with the buffalo, for instance, you know, when they, they killed a buffalo for spe- specific reasons, they honored the buffalo that they killed and they used every single part of the buffalo for something. Nothing went to waste. Um, and we are so frivolous, you know, um, whether it's, uh, whether it's, you know, people, people are th- throw away. We can, you know, just dispose of whatever we um want, you know, just to make ourselves feel happier or more secure or less challenged or less responsible. You know, it's, it's, I think it's so interesting based on what you said earlier about things being exposed. And I've been trying to watch as many interviews as I can of, um, of the film, The Sound of Freedom about um, the child trafficking and two million children are trafficked every year uh, globally, including many indigenous children and women. You know, indigenous women are are abducted and used for sex and murdered and never heard from again. It happens all the time. So again, you know, we have to we have to uncover all of this and tell the truth about it because that is the only way you know, for this, for us to heal, for us to heal. Yeah. Yeah. We don't even know what it feels like on the planet to have one day without bloodshed somewhere on the planet. And, and who is that bloodshedding serving? You know, that's my big question. Why is that necessary? You know, it's not on 90, 95% of us don't want anything to do with war. So why is that happening? You know, who, who are we feeding energetically um, allowing that to happen? Well, and I think, you know, as, as you may know, Mia, a lot of what I've been interested in is the, the energy of the astrological ages. And I truly, you know, in my own research of prehistory, It's clear that prior to 5,000 years ago, like if you go back to the age of Taurus, there were no signs of war. There were no fortifications around the villages or around the cities. There was a high um, valuing of art and culture and creativity and interconnectedness and the sacredness of the earth. And I truly believe it's as we moved into the age of Aries ruled by Mars and there were some climate change crises and other things going on that I think activated a lot of fear and led to this uh, influx in the Middle East of these nomadic tribes that then started devastating the villages and fostering this energy of war and con and conquest and power over. And I feel like that really, that paradigm took hold. And we've meant to heal that in the second half of the age of Aries, when it's balanced by Libra, coming right back into right relationship, when we moved into the age of Pisces, with Buddha and Christ and others trying to teach about healing and oneness. So I feel like we've carried the distorted energy of the age of Aries up through the present time. And it's time to stop it. It's time to heal. It's time to let go of those out of balance paradigms that lead to an incredible sense of separation 
and disconnection from each other, from the earth, from spirit that keeps us, as you were saying, carrying this inner sense of emptiness that then we then have to fill with our addictions to things or to other substances, or we project our discontent on each other and get polarized and then get caught in conflict. But also the wars are clearly profiting those in positions of power, the military industrial complex. So these are the paradigms that are putting us on a trajectory of destruction. And I truly believe everything astrologically right now is saying it's time to face that, stop that, and heal that to come back into balance, to remember who we truly are. And the role of women and the divine feminine is is a critical piece of, of, of that being able to happen. And I think women are finally at the point where there's no return for us, you know, we're not, we're not going back. We're not, um, we're not, you know, we're moving forward for the good of present day children, but future generations, we, we have no choice, but to stop, uh, you know, this out of bounds patriarchy, uh, that is, you know, so just completely out of control. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. It, we we have to reclaim the sacred feminine. Women need to be holding that and carrying those energies forward. And the men who've integrated the sacred feminine, and we have to reclaim that ancient wisdom of the ancient cultures and of the indigenous people who remember how to be in right relationship, right harmony, right balance with each other and the life around around us. So, and, and you've really been on that path for decades. Well, I, I, um, you know, I always thought that I, I grew up, I was born in Vermont, but grew up in Connecticut. Both of my parents were from Connecticut and I was pretty rebellious. I mean, I did get F's in conduct in Catholic grammar school in the seventh grade and <laughs> My my male teacher would say to me, Baraletto, if you were a boy, and I would say, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, it just seems so ridiculous that he would bother. But, um, you know, I had, I went through this phase of, of kind of uh, putting aside, you know, what I grew up in, you know, my father was a doctor, my mother ultimately became a lawyer. Education has always been very important to me. Um, but, you know, there was a time in, in at 42, and I know there's a major astrological event that happens at that time. The Uranus opposition, <clears throat> facing the truth of who you are. Right. And I knew that I just had to put the material life in its place and, um, and everything shifted. You know, it's not, it's not that I wasn't involved, you know, with the homeless and, and, so many other things. I mean, I, even as a child, I, my letters to the editor of the new in the Bridgeport post would be published and things like that, standing up for, you know, people who don't have as much and animal abuse and um, different topics that I would come up with. But now I, I'm totally, I'm, I'm totally integrated, you know, with my work. And I have to say, I'm doing the best work of my life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, living very modestly, but, um, I don't work for anyone other than myself and I'm, I'm not paid for the work that I do. So there's no conflict. Uh, yet I always have whatever I need to do what I want to do at that moment. And it's just a different way of living with reality. It's living in, in the moment, you know, without worrying about the past and, and fearing the future. Um, and, and living in alignment with your purpose. Right. With yeah. Your... And that's the thing for all of us when we're in alignment with our purpose, everything that we need to accomplish whatever it is at that moment in time is just given to us. You know, one thing after another will just spontaneously uh, appear. Um, and that's, you know, the power of co creating and 
being in sync, being in sync with the universe. Um, and being guided by synchronicities, which you certainly have across your life. Yeah, I always pay attention to the signs. <laughs> Um, you know, you and I had talked about this, but, um, after the last conference that I organized, uh, in 2021 in South Dakota, I was driving from Rapid City back to Wasta where I lived. And just as I was leaving Rapid City, there was this extraordinary, uh, vibrant rainbow on the right side. And it stayed with me. It's about a 45 minute drive, but it stayed with me the entire time. But Halfway home on the left side, um, a, a pretty big uh, uh, brush fire broke out. So I had billowing black smoke uh, on one side and this incredible rainbow on the other. And I got the message that this is what we're going through right now. We're really, you know, walking this divide between heaven and hell. And it's it's really up to us to stay, stay the course. Um, continue that you know we we were talking about that before Mia it is such a powerful image and so symbolic of the time that we're in and and you and I were also talking about how those of us that are on this path of healing and awakening and higher consciousness to try to bring heaven to earth are finding our tribe and and I love the whole reference to the rainbow tribe that, that will be gathering those from diverse cultures to be coming into unity, to be supporting these shifts on the planet. And that there are the fires, there, there is the turbulence going on, but the more that we're energizing the awakening and the healing and the transformation, not only in what we're how we're doing that with our consciousness, but how we're doing that with every decision, every action we take how we're living our lives, we are then emanating that transformation together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and talk about, and, and, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's extraordinary when you see it. There are days when I, you know, I'll just be sitting in my room working and I'll stop and I'll just say, did you really do that? <laughs> did you? Um, did that really happen? You know, because it's so like, you never could have predicted, I'm sure you feel the same way, you know, growing up, what you would be doing. I, I turned 67 in February, it, nothing could have prepared me, you know, for the for the life that I'm leading, frankly. Um but again, some of what I so respect in you is you, and, and, and you said this before we got on the video, how much we are soul selves having an embodied experience. And it it feels to me that early on, you found that connection and alignment with your soul self and what your path and purpose has meant to be in this lifetime, not knowing where that was leading, but following the guidance and having the courage to stay the course with that, which has led you into such an amazing variety of experiences, but all that are fostering justice, truth, healing. And I'd love for you to talk more about art because that's such a critical theme in all of this for you also. Um, Art is is very important. Um, my degrees are in fine art. Um, I um, had my first one person exhibition in Soho uh, my senior year of college, 1977, which again at that time was unheard of. Um, and my my work uh, was favorably reviewed in the New York Times when I was 30. Um, and what happened is the world became my arch. This is how I look at it. I, I feel that my, my activism has become my art form. And um, I, I do feel like I'm painting or constructing sculptures or some, you know, structure when I bring these energies and, and you know, aspects of different people and together to to make something happen 
And um, I also feel with things in the world the way they are, uh, I do paint occasionally now. I've come back to it a bit, but um, I, I feel like, you know, in a way that would almost be frivolous of me at this moment in time because there's so much need, you know, the need is so great on the planet. And, um, you know, like some people feel if we just keep our space um, calm and centered, you know, we are affecting other people. We are, but the reality is they're still starving. You know, they still have no shelter. Um, you know, my friends on Pine Ridge have no running water. Um, that's not acceptable. And we all need to do our little piece of, of changing that. Many years ago, a very wise friend of mine, Lee Sinella, who was a Kundalini master and psychiatrist and wrote a book on Kundalini in the 1960s, which is still considered a classic. He said that people needed to give away 50% of what they have to balance the wealth in the world. Um, and that when that happens, then free energy will be released and people will have the freedom and the time to go internally um, and develop their spiritual selves. And I think there's a lot of truth to that because compassion is such a cornerstone for all of our spiritual growth. Mm, um, and, story. you know, a, a simple little book that I refer to uh, was um, at the feet of the master, Chris, Krishnamurti's first offering when he was in his 20s um, that was published by um, uh, Annie Besant, which just describes, you know, essentially telling the truth. I mean, it's a little book that you could read the whole thing in an hour. Um, and he's really talking about his own spiritual path. But, um, you know, we we tend to look at spirituality as this, complicated thing um it's not it's actually so simple um but we have to be consistent and we we have to be committed to it but art getting back to art <laughs> art have to be committed to it and have to do, be willing to do the inner work right but the inner work is a blessing and a joy it's yeah. not it's not tedious it's not hard and as you know you know, one of the phases and and at the feet of the master describes this, you know, the phenomenon comes, you know, all the, you know, the psychic stuff and the, the manifesting of objects and all of that, all of that comes. It's part of, it's part of the journey if you're on the path, you know, I mean, there's so much humor in daily life in terms of all these, <laughs> you know, exactly what I'm talking about, all these, you know, funny little things that, I mean, I would one example, which I find hilarious, but I went into a card store um, when I was living in upstate New York and they had rubber duckies, those yellow, those famous rubber duckies, you know, that are everywhere, but they have them in different sizes. And I picked one up and I thought, oh, this is really cute. And I put it back down. And an hour later, I was 45 minutes away and I walked out of a store I was in and there was a rubber ducky by my driver's door, just sitting there on the ground. <laughs> I mean, you know, the stories are endless, but the fact is, you know, we we then, if we're on the path, we become open to the joys and the magic of being on the path. And it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary gift. It's such a blessing. And talk about creative, you know, you you can create anything. You come to realize that you do in fact have the ability to create just about anything that, you know, your mind and your heart and your soul want to see happen. You can, you can do it, you know, it's there to be done. That's why we're here. You know, it's so beautifully said Mia and, and that truly in this time of transition and transformation, we together can co-create a new world. Exactly. So we, we have to remember our capacity, the capacity of our creativity, the capacity of our consciousness. Absolutely. And, and I love your description of all that you do in the world is now an expression of your creativity of that's an art form for you. 
And I think art can be profoundly healing and profound in terms of our remembering the power of creativity and that creative expression. And you're also fostering this whole artist in residence program that's also supporting, again, bridging um, cultures and helping people to understand each other in their diversity. Well, um, I'm. Uh, we're just about to begin working on the website for the Adopt an Artist program, which is kind of an extension of Art Walk New York, which which I created many years ago for the Coalition for the Homeless. But um, suppose you are a painter uh, in Massachusetts and you want to go to Barcelona uh, for a month to paint. We will hook you up with a family in Barcelona that has living space and a studio space for you to paint. And you will essentially become part of the family um, while there. And you will share um, you know, you're cooking, you'll make meals for them, your favorite books, your favorite music, you'll discuss ideas that you have. And as the arts have been slashed in, in schools all around our country and most likely other places as well, um, for young people, young children to be able to expose to someone who's made their life uh, art, it, it will just, you know, be transformative. And at the end of your stay, there's a modest fee to register for this, um, which will allow you to use it uh, twice for one year. But um, at the end of your stay as an artist, your, your host family will choose a work of art that was made while they were in residence with you. And <clears throat> our goal, um, which we anticipate will we will hit in by around the fourth year is to have 20,000 artists a month participate with 20,000 artists a month participating we will have 10 million dollars of income each month and what we are doing is giving away half of that money or $5,000 a month projected every month to creative people and projects and human huh. services so we're constantly going to be funding um, good work in the world. And I have a, a wonderful team in New York City of uh, uh, two website designers who have done a lot with art organizations. And um, we've been tweaking you know, various things, but it should be up and running by the end of the year. And I have a number of people all over the world who've already said they would take artists. Um, but I've I've watched, you know, having organized many benefit auctions at places like Sotheby's and Christie's over the years, you know, living with real art. Um, and as Dr. Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, you know, tells us, art feeds the soul, you know, to live with real art on the walls is a totally different experience than a poster. And um, art elevates and is one of the doorways to higher realms of thought. So in a way, this is going back to Greece and Rome when, um, you know, art was always integrated into the And daily. earlier, like, Mia. And yeah. Early. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but as a librarian, slide librarian for the art history department in college, I always go back to Greece and Rome. But yes, exactly, Heather. And that's what we'll be doing. That's what we need because the average person is not thinking about feeding their soul. They don't have time. You know, we're being uh, frankly screwed every time we go to the grocery store and the price for everything has gone up from week to week, just about. If you have a family, how can you survive? You you can't, you know, you just can't. So, And, and, and again, it ties in with what we were talking about before. Before, there are all of these paradigms that are keeping us all constricted and keeping us all distracted and keeping us all caught, so many caught in survival mode. And as we can deconstruct those paradigms, as you were saying earlier, there is such a capacity for us all to be living in right balance and to then be able to thrive. And part of what I think is extraordinary about what you do, Mia, is 
you're not looking for those external policies or structures to change. You just go and foster this collaborative community effort to be the change that you are trying to foster in the world. And that's what's extraordinary about this program is how it can change individual lives, but then be changing communities and creating this global network of people that are connecting across cultures and connecting through that profound healing energy and consciousness expanding energy of art to be fostering that paradigm around the globe. Art has changed my life. It's taught me um, to think and create from nothing. An artist faces an empty sheet of paper or an empty canvas and, you know, creates a problem to solve, which becomes a work of art. And we, we have the capacity to do that in daily life with anything we're trying to solve. And um, I'm amazed um, by how other opportunities are kind of coming around, you know, in my little universe. And um, I, had begun talking to leaders of the Oglala Sioux tribe back in the spring of last year about war crimes against humanity, because listening to the descendants of survivors of the Wounded Knee Massacre and hearing them discuss, um, you know, the trauma, the embedded trauma and, and life on the reservation certainly reflects that. Um, and it struck me that it, you know, they don't have visible wounds like in Iraq from what America did, you know, dropping the dirty bombs and the white phosphorus, you know, for generations going forward, Iraqi children will be born with horrible birth defects, you know, not to mention the half a million people who were killed um, in Iraq. But um, we we have to, again, acknowledge and um, the first big event I ever organized to shelter from the storm artists for the homeless of New York was held at the cathedral of St. John the divine. And that place is so special to me because the Dean of the cathedral at that time was Reverend James Parks Morton, who was a major activist. Um, and, uh, their homeless shelter program at the time became the third beneficiary for the, for the auction I organized there, the art auction I organized there, and all the big artists, you know, Andy Warhol, who died the next week, donated, Frank Stella, Jasper Johns, you know, it was just incredible. But um, we are having another event, I don't know how many years later, from 1987, um, in early October, um, we are having an event to discuss all the war crimes against uh, the indigenous people and this, the theft of water rights in Navajo country over at Chaco Canyon, which was just recently announced by the Supreme Court, um, and many other things, genocide on the reservations, um, uh, incarceration of indigenous people and people of color. And Cornell West has agreed to speak at the event um, and we'll have six other speakers, uh, Chief Henry Redcloud and Wendell Yellow Bull will be speakers. Um, Henry is very big in tr uh, uh, solar power and, and just building these incredible energy efficient homes um, that look like little igloos uh, with uh, Jason Mackey from, from Massachusetts, but um, the P PBS is doing a, a, a documentary on them. It's airing in October, but um, the event will be streamed live from the cathedral. And interestingly enough, um, they're doing an installation with an artist named Anne with an E Patterson. And you can look her up. Her work is amazing. She has like 20 foot ribbons of different colors um, not too many colors, but, you know, they make forms or masses like they'll have a triangular edge with prayers written on them. 
So the mm. entire nave of the cathedral will have all these ribbons hanging down while this is going on. And um, the documentary, uh, Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker David France is um, working on a film about the life of Leonard Peltier. He's already filmed me opening the boxes of Leonard's art, but he'll come to the cathedral and film this. But when you look at the, the Lakota culture and uh, indigenous culture, the prayer ties, you know, that, that have yes. been used forever yes. and the ribbon skirts and the ribbon dance and, you know, these ribbons, I couldn't have, I couldn't have figured this out. You know, it's like, oh, by the way, we've changed the date <laughs> of this event and this is good. This art is going to be hanging in the cathedral. Oh, what an amazing synchronicity. <laughs> and, really? and that sense of the ribbons reweaving the web, reconnecting us to our reminding us of our interconnectedness, our oneness. But isn't that amazing? But what again, your event is about how we need to face what we need to heal from the past to stop these paradigms of destruction and abuse and violence and genocide. So this this is extraordinary. And before we have to stop, what would you say to people that are aware of some of the incredible injustice and trauma and suffering that's unfolding in the world and can feel overwhelmed by it and disabled by it. What would you say to all of us in terms of how we can be empowered to do what we are able to do to be a part of the awakening and healing process? I encourage people to just simply look around them in their own lives um, and, and, and pay attention to what is calling them because we are called, we are called to take action. Um, and if we, you know, sit and listen to ourselves, if, if we're quiet, everything comes to us, you know, in terms of our guidance and I, our higher selves will not allow us to make bad decisions. If, we are connected to it. You know, if we're really on, that's the thing. We can't, we can't do, oh, I think I should do that or worry about being a people pleaser. You know, we have to follow our own guidance because we, we have it. Everything we need to know about our lives and life exists within us, mm -hmm. but just take one step at a time. You know, if you, Choose, uh, write a letter to the editor of, of your local paper about something that you feel strongly about. Volunteer, um, you know, in an organization. Deliver Meals on Wheels. You know, help an elderly per person in your neighborhood who needs to go to the doctor or the grocery store. It's just endless. But the point that I feel is most important is just take the first step, you know, take the first step. It is in service to others that we are really at our best. Um, and you feel, you, you can tap into that universal love and support by being actively engaged um, in, these, in these activities. And it, it's not going to take over your life, you know, unless you decide that that's the road you want to be on permanently. Um, but it changes your life. It transforms the way you look at the world and you empower yourself by doing these things because you see change in action. You see that you've actually, you know, changed somebody else's life for the good. Um, so it's, it's, you know, and if anyone wants to get in touch with me, um, my email is, um, Mia, M-I-A dot Ferroletto, F as in Frank, E-R-O-L-E-T-O at gmail.com. So I'll respond to everyone, you know, who contacts me and happy to, you know, share whatever, you know, come, comes along, uh, that I think might be appropriate. Beautiful, Mia. And I will list your email and those other links um, to some of these other programs you're doing below. And I want to reiterate what you just said, because I truly believe that 
some of what we're needing in this transition time is to come back into alignment with who we are and with that deeper awareness. We're each here as a fractal, a creative expression of cosmic consciousness. We each have our gifts. We each have our role to play. And I loved what you said about not getting caught in, I should do this, but how do we go within, be in alignment with our true self, our soul self, what we're here for. And if each of us was living out of that energy of love and truth and right relationship, that would ha- play out in every everything we do and how we're impacting everyone around us, and the world could change overnight. Overnight, overnight, and overnight in in practical ways, you know? I mean, it's it's not like, you know, the new age, I feel, you know, in a way can be too out there, you know? In, In practical ways, we can bring heaven, heaven down to earth and, and getting back to where we started, which is finding your tribe. The tribes never let any member of the tribe go hungry or, or suffer in any way, you know, and, and we need to reclaim that model. The other piece that I want to just highlight again, Mia, is I, I truly believe part of what's so powerful in what you're doing is you're not waiting for people in positions of power to make these changes. We have the capacity to basically be creating a parallel reality that is about people being empowered to live a different way, to awaken, to heal, to be coming back into right connection with each other and co-create. A whole new way of being. We have to step out of those power over paradigms. I don't think it's about fighting them or waiting for them to change. It's about empowering ourselves to be living a different way of being, to be living a different paradigm that is the paradigm of the Aquarian age. And, and from my perspective, that's taking back our own sovereignty of self, coming back into right community, right connection with each other, coming into that awareness of our connection to the consciousness of the cosmos and co-creating a new world. You're exactly right. And there's no reason to push against, you know, there's no reason to, to, for any of us to use our energy that way. We just need to get started, you know, walking this different path, um, you know, approaching things from an artistic viewpoint, you know, a creative, a a self-creative way. It's there. It works. It truly works. (laughs) I promise you all it works. (laughs) Thank you for modeling that. Thank you for fostering that. Thank you for the way in which you're really building this community of co-creators. And I really honor you and all that you are doing, Mia. Oh, Heather, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Honestly, thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you for everything that you do. You are just an inspiration to all of us. Uh, really, you're you're a, a gift. Um, so thank you. Thank and thank you. you, Rory, for introducing us. <laughs> and thank you all for being a part of this conversation with us today. And being a part of this community that is working to co-create this world. Blessed be.